Hi, I'm Michael Smith. At Berkeley College, we're committed to educating the public about the importance of higher education and its impact on our communities. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, Valley National Bank, Berkeley College, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. That is talent. Oh. That is Laura Benanti, a Tony Award winning actress starring in She Loves Me, which is at Studio 54. Jesus. Now, see, I was there back in the day. Yeah. You're too young. So I, don't leave, I am too young. Leave that alone. Uh, <laughs> tell us about this. It is a beautiful old fashioned musical from 1962 based on um, something called Parfumery. And the, the easiest way to describe it is that most people know the film You've Got Mail. Yes. And it's based on She Loves Me and Parfumery and Shop Around the Corner. So it's it, what, I, what I love about it is even though it's a revival, it feels really fresh and modern and people come and they're laughing and crying and it's just a really, it's a feel good musical at a time when I think we all would like to feel good. <laughs> You grew up in New Jersey. I did grow up in New Jersey. In Kinalon. Kinalon. Not to be confused with Kinalworth. Yes, exactly. Well, no. what, would you be upset if I'm confused? How, how dare you, first of all, Kinalworth. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. We have a feud. All the Kinnels, you know. Is that we, true? No. Because we have a huge audience Nobody in Kinalworth. Cares. Don't offend them. Well, I love you, Kinalworth. See? Uh, and you want them to come and see the play. Exactly. Okay. So that being said, when you're a kid, yeah. school plays? Yeah. How I'm, early on? You know, my, I have always wanted to be in musical theater. I always wanted to be on Broadway from the time I can remember. I do not remember a time where I, that was not my goal. So the first thing I did, I was 13 years old. I played Casilda in the Gondoliers at the Pequannock <laughs> Gilbert and Sullivan Society. Up on Route 23? Exactly. Oh, stop. Not exactly. Okay, go ahead. And so then, and then I did the Barn Theater, which is community theater in Montville. And I did Evita there and Follies and Into the Woods. At 15 years old, I played Cinderella and in Into the Woods at the Barn Theater. And six years later, I played Cinderella and in Into the Woods on Broadway. So it was- You were on Broadway at- I was on Broadway at 17. 18. I auditioned to play Liesl in The Sound of Music, the revival of The Sound of Music on Broadway. I auditioned to play Liesl, and they ended up casting me as the understudy for Maria. And then when the actress who played Maria, Rebecca Luker is her name, when she left the show, I took over and I played Maria opposite Richard Chamberlain what? when I was 19 years old. Go ahead, describe it. It was unbelievable. You know, the last job I had had was in New Jersey, shoveling manure into bags and <laughs> carrying them to people's cars for at Tarulian Daughters. What? Yeah, Tarulian Daughters. It's not there anymore, but that was my job before I was on Broadway. I was just shoveling poop. Uh, now I'm in show business, so it's a different kind of poop. You know what I'm yes, saying? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and when your family and your friends yeah. come see you. Oh, my gosh. Crazy. My, I mean, my mother, who who is an incredible voice teacher um, in New Jersey, she has Linda Benanti Voice Studios. She taught me how to sing my entire life. She was right. an incredible actress as well. Um, she was so proud. I mean, how can you not be it? I had 
I had been a senior in high school doing my high school musical, and then the next year I'm on Broadway playing Maria. So you come out that door yeah. after the show. After Sound of Music? Yeah, Any they, show. We don't you care. You come out the you door know. and okay. you're there. My parents? Yeah. Oh, they're crying. Are you? Am I crying? Yeah. Maybe. Sometimes. And so today, when you come yeah. out, yeah. what's it like? Today when I come out? Yeah. I'm is just... This, this is like business? No, it's not business. It's still, it's still a huge charge. Look, I, I, I get to... All I ever wanted was to be on Broadway. All I ever wanted was to be a Broadway star. I didn't want to be on TV. I didn't want to be in movies. Really? I didn't care. All I wanted was to be Julie Andrews and Barbara Cook and Bernadette Peters and Patti Lapone and Cheetah Rivera. These women were Broadway. my idols. Broadway. That's Stage. all I wanted. So for me to A, achieve that goal at the age of 18 was remarkable. And however many years later, just a few. Just a couple. Five or six. I, I thought it was three, but Thank go ahead. You. Um, it's astonishing to me. I, I try to let mm. every note that comes out of my mouth be thank you because I'm just so grateful that I get to do what I love for a living. I don't have to shovel manure, you know well, what I mean? Well, other than that, which yeah. you, I don't think you'll be doing again anytime soon, but the other terrific people in this play talk about oh, them. Oh, yes. Is Jane Krakowski? She's a genius. I, I don't know if I've ever met a, 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 she's just so comedically gifted. And I think it comes from the fact that she comes from a place of truth. Yes, she's funny, but she really grounds her characters in, in truth. Oh, there she is. There you are. Yep. I'm the, I'm the one with the brown hair. Yeah, great um, chemistry. Yeah, well, she's, she's a Jersey girl. Yes, yeah, she, she is. You know, her parents worked at the Barn Theater that I was telling you about, and they, she would go with them to rehearsal, and they would put her to sleep in her crib and do the show and then bring her home. So she, when I was working at the Barn Theater, she was like a legend there because she had already gone to Hollywood and become successful. Right. Um, so, yeah, I feel honored to be working with her. She's a, she's a brilliant person. How, why are you writing a book called How I Stole <laughs> Your Boyfriend? It's, what is the whole title is I Stole Your Boyfriend and Other Monstrous Acts on My Way to Becoming a Human Woman. What's up with that? I think that, to, it's not prescriptive by any means. It is not like, <laughs> it's not a self-help book, but I do think that if any young women could read this book yes. and read some of the things that I am embarrassed that I did <clears throat> as a teenager and as an early, in my early 20s, yes. if I could prevent them from making some of those mistakes, then I will feel like it's, you know, it's all been for good. Let's do this. Okay, what okay. are we doing? Have you ever stolen yeah. one of your girlfriend's yes, boyfriends? I did. Because if you're going to do this, I'm going to do this. Okay. I've never... Okay. This girlfriend of yours, yeah. was it a good friend? Yeah, she was my roommate. Okay, this is further um, that I'm willing to go. Okay. Um, <laughs> when it happened... Yeah. Did you keep it from her? No. You told her? Yeah. So you did this terrible thing... Terrible thing. And then thing. were so guilted by it that you had to tell her? No, it was worse than that. I wasn't guilted like, I feel so bad for you. I was like, please don't be mad at me. Garbage person, garbage person. What? I know, it's horrible. I'm a much better person now. Uh, I'm gonna give you mine, you tell me how bad I am. Yeah, okay. We're in college. Yeah. About the same time you were. Yeah. So, um, that was a joke. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're in this, and my friend says to me, Yeah. watch this, and he had a beautiful girlfriend, uh -huh. and I knew yeah. she wasn't into him that much. And oh, he okay. said, could you, make sure she gets home safe because he was wanting to track and me the next sure. day. And I said, yes. Yeah. And I made sure she got home. And, and we wound up dating after that. Yeah. And I couldn't even face him. Yeah. And it's, he never talked to me again. Well, understandably. You should have seen this girl. Well, I'm sure she was I told my beautiful. wife about this, by the way. Well, good. I was going to say, I hope this isn't just like a confession that your wife is just going to yes. be like shredding your clothes when you get no, home. No, your actually, whole house yes. is on fire. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, it's something that, this, this girl is somebody that I, I know, she's a wonderful actress, she's hilarious and adorable, and well, she has forgiven me. Why would I write this? It's a book of comedic essays. Oh, okay, so it's, it's I thought a book. it was like some sort of thing, you want to say these are horrible things I've done. No, I mean, it's a book of comedic essays about my life. It's about growing up in New Jersey and being sort of oh, okay. an outcast from being obsessed with musical theater, coming to New York at 18, living by myself, not having any girlfriends, because anyone my age was in college. Not having any girlfriends? How could I? You didn't have friends? No, I was 18 years old. The only people in my show were either like 15 years older than me or the kids. Wow. So who am I going to be friends with? So unfortunately, what happened is I ended up having like be, being a serial monogamous and having a string of boyfriends because I was so lonely. And by the time all like girls my own age graduated college, they already had their group of friends. They didn't want to be friends with me. And also I'd already been doing theater for 
for four or five years. So, you know, who knows what they felt about that. And so then the first real friend I get, I steal her boyfriend. Like a, but you're a good like a person, big, I can tell. I, I, thank you. I appreciate that. I do think I'm a good person and I think good people make mistakes. And yes. I think that you can glean humor from that, which I certainly do in this book. But also, I want it to be a little bit of a warning to young women that, like, you have to prioritize your female friendships because those yes. are the ones that stay. You know, boys are for sometimes, but girls we're, are forever. We're, we're terrible people. You're, you're not. You're mostly terrible. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this yeah. before I get a couple minutes left. Okay. Should we talk about She Loves Me, the play I'm in, or should we just talk about the boyfriends? I'm sorry. <laughs> My producer's going to kill me for doing this. Okay. <laughs> talk about the play. Okay. I was so obsessed and feeling guilty about my friend Tim. I'm sorry. If I'm sorry, watching. Tim. Wait, where's the camera? That no, doesn't matter. No, I'm stop. Sorry, Tim. Stop. Who's the play for? Who is it for? That Georgette wanted me to ask you that. The play is for everyone. The thing that I love when I look into the audience is that it's like little girls with their moms with their moms. So it's intergenerational. And men love it too. It's it's so funny. I think people don't understand how funny it is. They think it's just going to be like, oh, it's romantic. But it, it's laugh out loud funny. The performances. I'm not talking about, talking about myself, but the performances are spectacular. Who are the other people? Jane Zach Krakowski, Zachary Levi, Gavin Creel. So talented people. So talented. We just got nine Drama Desk nominations, the most of any show. Four awards don't matter, right? No. Right? Right. Yes. Um, tell everyone where it is again. It is at Studio 54. On 54th Street. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Um, you love what you do. Yeah. Number one lesson, number one tip you want to offer anyone out there watching who says, I want to go into acting, you say? I say, if it is the only thing that you can imagine yourself doing, then do it. If you can imagine yourself doing anything else, then do that thing. Because for me, there is not anything on this earth that I would rather do so than So if you weren't doing this? I, I don't know what I'd be doing. Shoveling. Shoveling poop. <laughs> um, Laura Benatti is the Tony Award winning actress Benanti. starring in She, she loves, loves Me and she stole her best no, girlfriend, cool. boyfriend, roommate, you and it was wrong and she feels mouth. bad about it. Sorry about it, it Tim. No. Nope. Let's never forget Tim. Hashtag never forget Tim. We'll be back after this. <laughs> Visit us online at steveautobato.org. Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. That was from American Psycho, and there is Helena York. She's an actress starring in American Psycho, playing at the uh, Schoenfeld, right? Yes. And Jared tell everyone what's the, the premise of it. It's set in Manhattan, 1980s? In 1989, it's set in Manhattan. It's about this guy who works on Wall Street, sort of... Patrick Buchanan? Patrick Bateman. Bateman. And uh, would you... Uh, Patrick Buchanan, no, he ran for president. He's a conservative. Yeah. That would be Patrick someone... Patrick Bateman. Bateman. And you would be his girlfriend. I play his girlfriend. Uh, he plays this finance guy who uh, lives in on the Upper West Side, where we are right now. Yes. Um, and he's just sort of making his way. He's got his group of friends and um, sort of trying to fit in in this, you know, very bougie, upper crusty finance young guy world, um, but can't quite get a grip on himself. And so he kills a lot of people. Yeah, at night some stuff happens. Yeah, at night he kills a lot of... He, I don't want to say who he kills. Because I don't want to ruin it. Don't. Um, but just sort of goes on a killing rampage to make himself feel alive, connected to something. And, and it's, it's an inherent need within and, and him. And you? I don't kill anybody. I know you don't. Your character. <laughs> but you're with this guy. Yeah, I'm with this guy. So plays, what kind of character are you? He's, I basically fit into this world of his, you know, uh, Young people with money living in New York City, and he dates me because I sort of fit a mold. I fit an expectation of something he's meant to do, and he meets somebody else that you know piques his interest, but he knows that he can't. That's you in the black. That's me in the black, looking very mean. You look <laughs> as you, usual. You Less are what you there. wear. Yeah, that's the name of the song that we do. We sing a whole song about designers and. Um, it's just sort of a way of showing how surface level these people at that time were and what was going on in the 80s. And, you know, it was a, a time of prosperity and everybody was really feeling that. Funny, horrible, what? What is this? 
It's it's both. What's been interesting is um, is is the t is striking a tone. So it's not you're not going and saying like, oh God, it's really dour, or I'm really horrified the entire time. It's, I would really like to call it a black comedy, where you sort of have a lot of darkness and then you laugh in spite of yourself, and then moments where you feel an, an ominous thing coming on, you're still made to laugh, and and that brings the anticipation in a way that's different than if it was just you know some horror. Story. In terms of audiences, Helena, do you sense that, that the audiences are getting any younger that are coming, and do you think there's any connection to Hamilton? I, I do. I think that what's exciting is that I don't think I, you know, when you go out as an actress and you meet people and they find out what you do, they, they sort of, you know, think that that's interesting or they don't have a real connection to it. Maybe they saw Les Mis when they were younger or a fan of the opera or something like that. But now what's interesting is that I don't think I have dinner with anybody without them saying, oh, have you seen Hamilton? Have you seen this? And it, what, it's, what it's doing is that it's making, I hate to use this word, I feel like it's making theater trendy again yes. in a way that musical theater used to, the, the pop, pop music of the day used to be what was in musicals. Rodgers and Hammerstein were, you know, the top 20 of the time when, when you know, in the golden age of musical sure. theater. And I think what we're hitting now is, is another golden age. There was an interesting piece in New York Magazine about it and um, about how people are talking about it again. So, you know, if if Hamilton is getting people to go to the theater, or even something like Wicked, which has a, a younger draw, it's 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 what what's next. And they have mm. a lovely experience and um and and coming back and and building a base that is that is embracing a, a younger audience. Um which which is interesting because, you know, it's it's not something you you know, young people go to a movie. Real quick, like on the television side, give me give us a plug for the thing you're doing with Nick Nolte called um, Graves. I'm, I'm doing a show called Graves, which is going to be on Epics. I play Nick Nolte's daughter. He's a former conservative president of the United States looking to redefine his legacy. Um, complicated character, as you can imagine, um, having somebody like Nick Nolte do that. Um, I play his very troubled, newly divorced daughter. You love what you do. I love what I do. Were you born to act? Um, I, I was... I think so. I think I think people that do this have sort of um, an, an open eye to things around them, to be able to observe others and and and, and put that into and, and characterize, bring something to life that is outside of themselves. Um, and I've always I've always been an observer, and I've always loved being around people. And I think that that's what I love most about what I do. People should go see Helena York uh, in American. Psycho, the musical. The musical. At uh, Schoenfeld Theater, uh, West 45th Street, right here in the heart of New York City. Thank you so much. Thanks. Wish you nothing but the best. Thank you very much. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this from the Tish WNT studio here in the heart of New York City. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank it was you. Great. Visit us online at steveautobato.org. Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Now, that is from a play I've never seen. What is that play called? Uh, Fiddler on the, the House, on the, the Woof. Fiddler on the Roof. Yes. Uh, yeah, by the way, this is uh, Michael Bernardi, actor on Fiddler on the Roof. And you come from pretty famous stock, don't you? I've, I've been told, yes. Yeah, Herschel yeah. Bernardi. Herschel Bernardi, yes, yes. He's... Can we show a shot real quick? Yeah, please, go ahead. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's Papa. With and the who's same that kid? haircut. Uh, that's <laughs> some kid that looks terrified, I think, but... And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and talk real quick, your yeah. dad, Fiddler, Fiddler on the Roof. Make yeah. that connection, then we'll talk about you. Well, my father, uh, he did a lot of the stories of Shalom, Shalom Aleichem uh, and uh, then made a career in television doing Peter Gunn um, and then got the opportunity to do Broadway uh, and was offered the role of Tevia after Zero Mostel wow. left the show. And uh, so, and Sheldon, by what Sheldon Harnick said, uh, he thinks he was the best have you. Um, I think Danny Burstein might be giving him a, a run for his money. Uh, Plays heavy in right now. Play, exactly. Who and he's absolutely fantastic. Tell people why they should go see this. Because it's 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 been around for fifty years for a reason. It's an incredible show. 
I mean, it's structurally, it's literally just structurally speaking. Mm -hmm. The music, even if you don't, you think you don't know the music, you know it some way. You don't know you know it. You don't know you know it. Or you, if you know you know it, you know you know it. And I'm Italian, I'll appreciate it. <laughs> of course you will, See? it's about family. It's about family. Well, there's a story of, uh, my father went to, uh, to Japan uh, with like this, all these people from the Broadway show in Fiddler and uh, met the Japanese Tevya. And uh, the Japanese, they were doing the production out there and the Japanese Tevya turned to my father and said, I don't understand how you do this show in America. It's so Japanese. <laughs> it's so Japanese. Yeah. But that it is. is. It's universal. It's universal. Family, and it's a faith, brilliant story. So great. yeah, it's yeah. about family. It's about faith. It's... Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about yeah. you for a second. Please. Really? You got into the business. <laughs> How old? Oi. Um, Oi, what do you got to do with Oi, Oi for me? What do you, because, you know, right away, it's in Oi. my soul. Yeah. It's in my soul. Yeah, well, we, I have a expression. different one. <laughs> OK, at eight. At eight you years eight. old. What were you yes. doing at eight? I was doing stand-up comedy. Where? At the Comedy Store on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles. Get out of here. I know. Who else, who else was there? Bob Saget, Chris Rock. Bob uh, Saget was sitting right there about six months are ago. Are you serious? He, he was the best. <laughs> so Saget, yeah. Chris Rock, not Andrew yeah. Dice Clay. Of course Andrew Dice Get Clay. Get out. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing at eight years old with those guys? So I was very much a, um, a weird kid. I was very, <laughs> I was very quiet uh, at school. But then I would come home. My mother was like this incredibly social, gregarious person, uh, still is today. Um, and she would have these, you know, these parties uh, over, over at the house. And I identified with adults as a kid. And I was uh, always, you know, telling jokes or, or telling stories or listening or talking about relationship problems, you know, all sorts of crazy things. At eight. Things. At eight. And yeah. you love Robin Williams. I love Robin Williams. Go ahead, yes, I'm sorry. Exactly. I was watching Robin Williams live at the Met incessantly. And so a family friend said, hey, there's this stand up comedy class for kids. They've none, never done it before. Um, why doesn't he try it out? And so uh, my mom, against her, uh, you know, her own judgment, said, you want to do this? I said, yes. And so I showed up to this class. And uh, after a few weeks of basically rehearsing our bits and stuff like that, uh, we had our first show, which was on a Saturday night in front of 300 people. It was a prime time slot. And uh, all the kids freaked out. Uh, a lot of kids didn't uh, finish their sets. Of course they did. Of co I mean, they were eight years they old. Out. They were 10. They were terrified. I attribute it because I, no one knew I had really bad vision. I didn't. <laughs> I'm wearing contacts <laughs> right now. And I could not see the people's faces. And so I think that I just, I looked at the lights, I said my lines. What I do you heard, said your lines? What, 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 eight years old, what are you okay. doing? All right, so my, my opening line was, hello, my name is Michael Bernardi, I'm eight years old, and I have a bad life. <laughs> you didn't say that. I swear to God. Did you describe your life? Uh, yeah, being raised by women, you know. Uh, the, you know, my, my father was, uh, out of, my father had passed away to go from, you know, comedy to pathos. But uh, he had passed away when I was about a year and a half years old. Mm -hmm. And so I was raised by women, and it was funny. And you, you know? talked about, by the way, you also talked right before we got on the air yeah. that Lorena Bobbitt, that, that, I don't <laughs> have no right. idea, you told me about the Lorena Bobbitt thing with Wayne Bobbitt, That's a right. little incident that happened. Well, it, uh, are you telling me you worked that into your routine yeah, at eight years old? At eight years old. You're, yeah. you're, you're making this up. So, I mean, you can ask my mother. Well, this is PBS, and like, there's no way you're going to work this in clean. Oh, Actually, clean. no, you not. You there better is, be there clean. Is. I'll, I'll be, uh, I will it's be. It's a family. Uh, people who know what happened yeah, we know, know what happened. Yeah, we know. I forgot. Okay. So. All of a sudden, our crew is very interested. So, Go ahead. I'm, uh, my mother was watching the, the 2020 special when Lorena yes. Bobbitt was explaining, right? Yes. And, uh, and I was uh, listening in the other room. And I'd poke my head in, and my mom would say, no, you, Dick, you can't, can't listen to this. By the right? way, if you want, Google Lorena Bobbitt, Wayne Bobbitt, yeah, yeah, you'll, yeah. you'll get the details. Right, Go ahead. Exactly. And, uh, and I hear this, I'm hearing the thing, I think it's hilarious, <laughs> but I'm trying to control my laughter. And, uh, and she says, Lorena Bobbitt, to Barbara Walters, well, I didn't mean to be vicious. I didn't mean to be vicious. Right. And uh, I started, I bursted out into laughter. And uh, my mother said, like, get bed, go to bed. Um, because I thought it was absurd, you know? Like, it was, it's, it's, it was an incredibly vicious, vicious. act. Vicious, horrible. It's horrible. Horrible. And just, she said it so innocently, it was hilarious. And so, and so, hold on, you gotta do this. Yeah. Where's the humor? 
Where's the humor? Yes. Okay, so I got on stage <clears throat> the next night and I started talking about how she did it, because uh, no one knew what was going on. And I was trying to get in the mindset of, uh, of the first police officer that, that found that All right, leave it alone. All right, I, I'm getting I mean, off this. Edit this out. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought we were going so somewhere that made I mean, sense. You that's keep it. asking no, questions. I asked questions. I thought I was going to get an answer that made sense. <laughs> All right, an eight-year-old talking yes. about Lorena and Wayne I, Bobbitt. I, I apologize to I the know. public broadcasting audience. I'm Can we get back saying. to Fiddler? Yes, please. Faith. Family. Family. <laughs> Japanese. Japanese. Yes, universal. Italians love it. Irish love it. Jewish right. audience love it. Okay. Yes. What do you love? Hmm. Watch this transition. About the live experience on Broadway. <laughs> um, I feel incredibly connected um, to my father and to, and it's not just my father, my entire family, my grandparents. You know, they came from Eastern Europe. They were both actors. They performed in barns, and they were in the Yiddish theater. And then they uh, came to the United States and went to the Goodman Theater in Chicago, got married on stage, um, pioneered a lot of the roles from Shalom Aleichem in these Yiddish stories. And there's actually a picture of my grandfather dressed next to a cart, and he looks like Tevye, the, the milkman, the Luftmensch. Um, he's this incredibly gregarious um, father uh, who his faith is being questioned. Yeah. And, um, and uh, there's Danny. It was just unbelievable. And, and you're Michael. I'm Michael. The, are you the understudy? If you I'm look? understudying Danny. I'm trying to understand. Yeah. So I'm playing Mordecha the innkeeper yes. on a nightly basis. And then uh, I also understudy Tevia. And uh, I haven't gone on yet because Danny is literally a machine. Um, <laughs> and there's been a lot of offers from family members to, you know, you know, poison him or something like that. And I, I, I say, wow. no, you know, don't do that. That wouldn't be a good thing. Um, but I'm just, I'm, I feel so grateful just to stand in the wings, share the stage with him, and, and learn so much on a daily basis. I love um, what you do. Yeah. You feel blessed. I feel incredibly blessed. And as much as you love something, you know, there's, it comes with the trials and the tribulations of that, but that's when you know you really love it, you know? I hear um, you. But right now, it's, it is, it is just the good stuff. Fiddler on the Roof, um, Michael Bernardi and uh, the great cast uh, at the Broadway Theater. I want to apologize for asking about that other incident that we'll ignore. <laughs> And welcome to uh, the PBS audience. Thank you very much. A real pleasure, man. <laughs> that was great. Awesome. That was fun. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Valley National Bank, Berkeley College, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.